welcome back to the podcast. Um, my name is Kaylina, and this is the Fox's Hideaway. And today we are going to be talking about witchcraft and witchcraft in the sense of history. So if you're not a history buff or a history nerd, or if you just don't give two shits about any of that, this is not going to be the video for you because we are going to be going over the history of witchcraft as it was seen in England from 1558 to 1718. And uh, yeah, so let's get started and then I'll explain more. Okay, so I've been reading a couple of different books here and I'm all witched out today um, because why not? Um, I've been <laughs> huh. okay. I've been trying to get through the three books of occult philosophy or magic originally published in 1897 by Henry Cornelius Agrippa and that's what this book looks like. I still have about over 100 pages left, and I literally am not even quite sure I'm going to be able to do it. I, I just, this is the most, first of all, it's written in that old English style, like, you know, the typical books that you had to read in high school that you were forced to read during your summer break, and I'm speaking from experience. Uh, the books such as um, The Iliad and the Odyssey, um, that, that might as well be this kind of writing style, and it's painful to read, and I guess I'm either not intelligent enough to figure it out, or I, I don't know, but I'm struggling big time on this, and half of it, I don't even understand what he's talking about. The other half, there are things that, okay, why I decided to try to read this book was because it was supposed to, like, take you back to kind of the beginnings of witchcraft, kind of breaking it down again, and... Which would be good for me, because my witchcraft introduction was not like a lot of people's. Like, I kind of nosedived off the deep end when it came to the witchcraft stuff, because there's always been like an underlying part of me that really loved it, even like years ago before I even knew that it was actually a thing. Like, there was just something drawing me towards that. And so my first, first witchcraft book ever, I had found at an antique store, and... So my, my introduction to witchcraft, I didn't learn the typical way that a lot of people start out with. And so there's probably a lot of, there probably are still some holes here and there within my own practice and craft that, because I didn't start at the baby steps of like the basics and the way most people should start, um, my foundation was not maybe as sturdy as probably some people. It's not, it's not to say it isn't now, but I learned through more advanced things up front and kind of now worked my way back. So I was trying to read this book to just go through almost the baby steps I didn't take at the beginning of my practice just to see if there was anything that I was missing. Unfortunately, I've been glad to say that as I've been reading this, I already knew a lot of this stuff from the more advanced books and stuff that I've already read and already learned about the subject. And, I mean, let's face it, today anymore, with the numerous amount of practitioners that share their practices online, like, and there's tons of really, really amazing, amazing practitioners that share their knowledge on YouTube. And... Yeah, so between that and tons and tons of books, like, I, I feel like fairly confident I filled in the gaps. But this book is just, oh my gosh, it's painful to read. It's so hard to read. Like, I've never been good with, like, old English. Like, it might as well be a textbook to me. It might as well be, you know, the parents from the Peanuts. They're like, meh, 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 meh. That's what it sounds like to me, um, reading these kinds of books. So... I, I, I never like to not finish up a book because there's always just like that sense of accomplishment that I get by finishing up a book, but I don't know if I can do it. I have been so unmotivated to read any more of this, and there's just a lot that isn't even like helpful to 
modern day witchcraft. Like there is a ton of where he'll just go on these ramblings and maybe it's ramblings to me because I'm like I said just not smart enough to understand what he's talking about but these ramblings of just different things where if you combine a toad's heart with this and that and something else then this will happen and things that as far as my knowledge goes I would never do in my own practice I'm not saying that maybe there aren't people out there that don't still do some of this stuff but not in my practice I don't so I'm just like I it's not relevant to me anymore and while some of the stuff is relevant as far as like the planets go and their associations and that kind of stuff there's about a billion other things that you could probably read and get the same information out of that's a lot more focused and clear cut than this because if this was if this was my introductory to witchcraft I would have been like not for me man not for me and I don't know I guess maybe that's more I'm not saying ceremonial side per se but where you really pay attention to like the nitty ditty nitty gritty details and like and and there I have mad respect for that like I do I really do but it's just not my thing like I'm kind of one of those people that just throws things together whatever I'm feeling drawn to in the moment whatever correspondences are speaking to me in the moment and that's where we kind of go, how I'm feeling, what I feel like I need to work on, what spells are involved in my life, you know? And so, anywho, that, that's a lot of babbling about that for a book that I'm probably not even going to finish. But um, in other notes, I have to say thank you to, oh, I don't remember your login information but the last time I was talking about my pesky spirit that is still up to its old tricks um but I can happily say that I have not had any more bad dreams since I put the water under my bed and so that has worked and I also put vinegar in there and salt and so between those three things I have not had any more spider hallucinations I have not had any more like bad dreams so Thank you for that suggestion. Super helpful. I don't know why I didn't think, like I've had tourmaline by my bed and I have some other protective crystals and stuff, but that wasn't quite getting the job done all the way, but doing that really helped. So, but I have to say, um, now it's trying. <laughs> so I did a hardcore cleansing the other day and apparently whatever is here did not appreciate that. And I have a feeling there's no true way to get rid of it because it's attached to the house and it's spending most of its time downstairs, I think in the area of the house that my other renter is renting. So there is no way to cleanse that part of the house. So it goes there and then comes right back after I've cleansed. But we're dealing with it because most of the time we're just ignoring it. And uh, I just continually remind it that it has no power over me or my pets that live here and uh, that it really can't do anything to us. Um, but it decided it would be super fun to lock me out of the house the other day. And you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. Um, I went to get an Amazon package off the porch. Didn't bring my cell phone, didn't bring my keys with me because I was like, well, I don't need them. I'm just going outside real quick and coming right back in, right? No. After turning back around to open the door, it is literally locked locked it was not locked i swear to god before the padlock was not like turned any wrong way both of them were in the unlocked position and i couldn't get back into the house i had no way back into the house so fortunately my nice neighbor next door was able to come over with a knife and like jimmy rig it open which is slightly discomforting knowing that anyone could really break into my house if they really wanted to and uh but I was very thankful in that moment that he was able to get me back in the house because I'm not sure what I would have done. So, yeah, it locked me out of the house. And then yesterday when I was watching a movie in here, I have books that are on my shelf down here. And as I was watching, I mean, they're sturdy books. They're like the Percy Jackson books, like the, the big, thick ones, though, like from the other series. Um... My, my childhood books of Percy Jackson. I still love those books. Um, but anywho, one of them just like 
fell over by itself, like completely right in front of me. And I was like, and I even put the book back on and like shook the shelf to see if I could get it to do it again. It wouldn't fall. So I'm like, cool. Something's just up to their little tricks and stuff. But as a whole, I've just been ignoring it. Um, cause I tried to have like a reasonable conversation with it through tarot the other day, just because I, I'm familiar with spirit work, but not like an expert by any means. And I'm constantly trying to learn things about spirit activity and stuff, but just to see, is this a spirit that's just trying to get my attention that just wants something, you know, but after the complete jumbled mess of tarot that it was giving me with contradictory answers at every single turn, I've established it's definitely it, it has no, like, no aspiration to be a decent spirit of any kind. It's just here to cause trouble and mischief. And at this point, I'm just going to continue to cleanse. I'm going to continue to ignore it. I'm going to continue to tell it that it has no power over me. And uh, we're just going to count down the days until I can move out of this freaking house. The end. Um... Yeah, because without being able to get to the other neighbor's section of the house, I don't know how we'd officially be able to keep it gone. But that being said, uh, we're it's not really like a true issue anymore. Okay, on to what I actually want to talk about today, which is the other book I've been reading besides Iron Flame, um, the sequel to Fourth Wing is A History of Witches in England from 1558 to 1718 by Wallace Notestein. And there's a couple different reasons I picked up this book and wanted to read it. One, because I personally actually really enjoy history and I have quite a bit of knowledge about the Salem witch trials and I have some knowledge about the other witch trials that have happened, but I wanted to know more because I'm actually trying to write a fictional book set in England around the time of the witch trials. And so, as anyone might know with writing historical books, there's a certain level of accuracy that you need to portray in your writing. And so, I needed to know the events, the different places where these trials took place, you know, who was raining over this time and just more information as a whole. So I have been watching some different documentaries as well as making my way through this book, but I figured, hey, if I'm reading this information, why not share some of the history with you guys as well? So we're going to do a part one and a part two because this stuff is hefty, but I'm going to try not bore you guys to death and try to keep it somewhat lively and probably have pictures and stuff going on in the background if I can get my lazy ass to add them in there. Otherwise, just listen to me in the background as like podcast style because that's what I tend to do with a lot of the people that I watch is listen to you guys while I'm doing my massage job. So, um, alright, so I've kind of broken it up in chapters. And so this first part is all about just the beginnings of English witch witchcraft as a whole. So we're going to start with Elizabeth and the Elizabethan era. And so she was actually just as scary as any of the other kings were as far as like the death punishment goes with witchcraft. Now, as far as being like condemned or being accused and executed, you had to have a little bit more proof than um, James who came after. You kind of had to have actual proof that the witch had like murdered somebody or um, you had to actually get like a real confession out of them. Versus later on, you could pretty much just be accused by somebody and that was enough to secure your, your death. Um, which is crazy to me. I find it so interesting, obviously being a witch nowadays, 
seeing the real history of witchcraft through other practitioners and seeing what witchcraft obviously really actually is throughout different practices versus the hysteria and the absolute superstition that people back then had. And even today, people still have a generally very negative connotation about witchcraft because they actually have no idea what the fuck we actually do. They just think we're all sitting in our little houses, you know, condemning people with curses and, you know, animal sacrifices and no judgment if that's your thing, but majority of us aren't doing that. Um, but it's so funny just even just, I guess I'm in the fortunate position where I can freely practice witchcraft and openly talk about it if I want to. I still get massive weird looks from majority of the people I open that can of worms with, but obviously <laughs> I'm not going to have anyone condemning me to be burned at the stake and or be hung or killed and tortured in some other horrible way. Um, that's not the same, not the same can be said for everyone even today. In other countries, there's still very much a fear and a harsh punishment awaiting you if you get caught for that. So, but, for me, I'm pretty open about it. I'm like, yeah, I practice witchcraft. Like, and I guess it's just come from the fact of for so long, we haven't been able to talk about that. <laughs> Sorry, my little dog is sitting on the heating pad, um, and it was making weird noise. And uh, kind of scared me because the other day, I uh, a little mouse got stuck in one of my spider traps. And he's, he was perfectly fine. I helped him. He was all good. We got him off the trap. He wasn't injured or anything. But it just scared me because I was like, oh, no, not again. Um, but no, it's just my dog. Okay, so, yeah, so witchcraft. I'm a lot more open about my practice than a lot of people maybe are or, or feel comfortable sharing. And so, it's just funny seeing how much of a reaction you get from people when you talk about that. And it's like, there's just... Most people either look at you like, <laughs> okay, weirdo, whatever, or you get the people that straight up are just like, oh my god, you're going to hell. And I'm like, okay, nice, pleasure chatting with you too. That's, that's great. Awesome. Um, without even trying to understand where these practices come from or the, what we truly do. So, but yeah. Back then, Elizabeth was just as bad, which kind of, I don't know why it surprised me, but I guess being a woman and having her be a woman as well, you would have thought there would have maybe been less of that, but nope, there was just as much fear around her reign as there was with James's. However, James's, we'll learn later, obviously had more deaths than Elizabeth because under Elizabeth's statute, it was harder to actually condemn someone. But she punished anyone that did any kind of conjuring, sorcery, anything that was considered witchcraft, or any other related crimes um, involving that. So her first bill, it was drafted within her first year of reign, but it wasn't passed until 1568. And it stated that any use of magic would have the person killed or destroyed, as well as anyone who aided or counseled them as well. So there was also a punishment for practices that involved like wasting or laming a person. Um, there would be a one year imprisonment as well as four visits to the pillory. And the second offense would be instant death. It was also stated that anyone by the means of witchcraft to find treasure that was stolen, um, property, or provoke any person to unlawful love shall also endure one year's imprisonment and four visits to the pillory. And in case anyone doesn't know what the pillory was, um, it was pretty much the stockhold where you had your neck and your wrists trapped standing 
for a long length of time, hours, sometimes days, um, and your fellow asshole neighbors and citizens could come and pretty much brutalize you in whatever means they felt necessary, such as throwing different items at you, like food or animal, like visceral, like animal parts, and uh, sometimes even rocks. So people would come out of this with potentially broken jaw, um, they could be blinded, they could have other broken bones and head trauma, as well as even paralysis in some cases, and it could even be as serious as death. Um, people are mean to each other. Uh, thank God some of these things aren't still around today, because I, I think people today can be, like, brutally awful to each other, but the things our demented little minds came up with back then... I don't know. I still worry sometimes. Anytime, you know, you a new Saw movie comes out, I'm just like, who are the people sitting in this boardroom going, yes, this would be an awesome thing for people to watch somebody go through. Gotta wonder. You gotta wonder. Um, okay, so the English churchmen who had been run out of England during the Marian persecution, they had been kind of lying in wait in Geneva and Zurich. And they had kind of been making friends with the continental theologians at that time. And then they came back once Elizabeth was in on the throne and took like prominent roles within the church and the state. Uh, and I'm guessing these were most likely Puritans. So the Puritans in England, actually, while they did get some like notoriety and they did build up to a certain extent, the Roman Catholic Church was still, like, kind of the thing. And then there was the Protestants as well. So, it actually ended up the Puritans, as we know, mostly moved to America, um, because they were kind of trying to overthrow the church, but it obviously didn't exactly work. Um, so the Puritans weren't hated, but they weren't exactly liked either in England. So a big fear that definitely kind of helped provoke the witch trials was the fact that there was the whole battle between Elizabeth and Mary Queen of Scots. And so they were both kind of fighting for control. And Elizabeth was Protestant, which meant when she took ascension, the Catholic Church would have to relinquish its grip on England. And that was kind of frowned upon. So. It was also said that Mary was supposedly giving like ministers bad dreams and a constant threat of both the Catholic Church and the Spanish attempting to take Elizabeth's life. There was plenty of things to keep kind of that fear alive and a lot of the times witchcraft was being blamed for that as well. So during this time there were two kinds of conjurers that were said to be around so you had your position seekers and then you had your treasure seekers. And so the position seekers used different charms and different incantations to gain power within, within different groups of people. And they used it to gain favor and uh, just kind of promote themselves in life. And then you had your treasure seekers, which were a little less... Uh, known not as many of them as the other and they were believed to find like treasure through the science of magic so then you have like your cunning women and oh I feel like you can't I can't see my face there that's far okay so then you had your cunning women which this is what a lot of the witches slash like healing women of the day back then kind of referred to themselves as and a lot of these women actually had some medical knowledge and some pseudo medical knowledge uh, and knew how to practice medicine so these were if you were lucky considered good witches and so they used different herbs and different extracts and sometimes charms and enchantments to help cure people from different ailments and uh, lesser diseases 
They were called upon quite often, and it wouldn't be uncommon to go to one of these women if you needed help with something. And although the church kind of frowned upon it, they didn't really stop people from doing this. And at that time, the church didn't really have harsh punishments to implement if this was going on. Oftentimes, it would become these cunning women's job to identify when witchcraft was used against somebody and sometimes to even sort of identify and detect the witch responsible. However, most of the time these women were really smart and wouldn't outright name somebody. They would kind of use descriptions or give them different things that they needed to do to get this witch to come forward, um, but they never really just outright name someone. The suspicion almost always began with some kind of ill words directed at a neighbor or a competitor of some sort, and that attack really um, made it so that their reputation couldn't be saved. At this point in time, there was no way to distinguish between fake doctors and like the quacks or like fake people. Uh, practicing at the time either. Which, in some cases, you see that even today where people in the medical field really scoff at more holistic approaches. And although there are definitely some that I'd be like, please don't try, uh, there are others that, although they don't have as much science backed because there's a whole conspiracy about that too, where... Um, a while ago they made it so that any kind of holistic thing if you wanted money to support your um, findings and to continue to study it couldn't be holistic in nature it had to be more of a pharmaceutical base and there is proof that that happened and so yeah some of this knowledge never got past a certain point because if you did admit to it you wouldn't be funded and on the other hand, you see a lot of these more in like Eastern medicine because they have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. Often like these women, like it was just passed down and that's what they did. Um, but it was very, very obvious that the government feared any kind of conjurer. And even these medicine women were kind of in trouble too if they you know, got in the wrong view of someone, then they could be in just as much trouble as anyone else. Um, and so the government put kind of a lot of resentment on these people that were suspicious of witchcraft. And so it kind of caused the perfect environment to stir up a lot of fear. And so... While the government was putting down the conjurers, the justice of peace, they were compelled, along with the judges, to start hanging the witches. Uh, and keep in mind, a lot of these women, and the few men that did get in trouble as well, probably most likely were not doing a single thing wrong. Um, and, I mean, heck, even if you are practicing witchcraft, that's not wrong either. So... Um... So at this time, as long as the state was not interested in a particular case, the church was allowed to kind of keep jurisdiction over these cases. However, that all changed during the second half of the 16th century when Henry VIII broke away from Rome and kind of created his own Church of England with, of course, him at the center of it because, you know, who else? And uh, so this meant that all the power that the church had now fell under the king and his judges and his ministers. So witchcraft, even on like a light offense, suddenly became a crime. The next section is witchcraft under Elizabeth. So in 1566, it marked the first important trial. This was the first trial to be accounted in the witch chap books. 
and a large portion of the knowledge that we have about the witch trials during this time comes from these pamphlets. And they are brief and compact, and the pamphlet of 1566 was titled The Examination and Confession of Certain Witches at Chensford in the County of Essex Before the Queen's Majesty's Judges, the... Uh, 10, 20, 25, 26th day of July, Anul 1566. My Roman numerals, man. <laughs> it's rough. Um, okay, so during this, Elizabeth Francis was examined and accused of villainies. Uh, and so a common theme during the witch trials, I find, is that once one woman is accused, she just throws everyone else under the bus too and just starts naming names and accusing other people, which we wonder why women have a hard time today of, you know, lifting each other up and really being supportive. Well, this is a great example of um, that not happening because she threw her grandmother under the bus, which who does that? Who does that? Who throws their own grandmother under the bus? And she stated that her grandmother gave her a cat named Satan, which sounds a lot like Satan. And uh, so they took care of this cat. She took care of the cat. And in return, the cat would give her whatever she wanted. And so at this time, Francis wanted a particular man. And uh, but the cat told her at first, yeah, you shall have this guy. And then she didn't end up having him. And so Francis told the cat to touch the man and the man died. So then she asked for another husband because what do women want back in the day? Men, I, I guess, because they had no say of their own. Um, and this time she got this man, but unfortunately it was not a happy marriage. And um, she kept the cat for about 15 years and then just passed it over to a woman by the name of Mother Waterhouse. And she was also like a poor woman who was then also examined for witchcraft. And this was not uncommon back then. Any poor beggar woman with any kind of deformity or who, you know, was slightly unfriendly or rude one day, these were pretty much easy targets. And so I have to say this was like the longest living cat ever because the cat was still living at 15. Like, I mean, cats can definitely live that long, obviously, but anywho. Then, Mother Waterhouse claimed that she then used the cat to kill other animals and even a neighbor that she didn't really like, ending with her own husband. And at one point, she turned the cat into a toad. And after being refused a piece of bread, she sent this toad after the neighbor's daughter in a form of a black dog with horns. That was also kind of a common theme, was the dog with horns for some reason. And she was once again called to the stand uh, after that. So then Agnes Waterhouse, uh, she did end up suffering the penalty of law, but not before having to add to her confession. However, historians are fairly sure the pamphlet is incomplete. And um, Elizabeth Francis, the first woman we were talking about who enjoyed accusing everybody, she ended up escaping. But again, in 1579, which was 13 years later, she was accused again, leading to a second trial at Kelmsford. So she'd been accused of cursing a woman and causing her some kind of pain of some sort. And like before, she began throwing other people to the wolves, so to speak. Um, and with this case, there isn't much information about the outcomes of it, uh, but for sure, at least one woman went free and three women were condemned and executed. In both cases, wild tales were spun of spirits and familiars taking forms of animals. And this was another big one, the whole familiar thing, where heaven forbid a woman looked nicely at a dog or a cat or, you know, feed a stray bird 
don't do any of it because that automatically means that you have little imps um, in the form of barnyard animals doing your dirty work for you, uh, which of course was obviously not true. Uh, all of these cases were absolutely haphazard at best. There was no witness agreement. There was really no evidence or proof for anything. Um, one witch would have a falling out with another, and so then both would end up accused. Um, you know, you walk by somebody just talking to yourself, the next day they fall ill, the next thing you know you're being hung by your neck. Like, this was just a common occurrence, so whatever you do, don't talk to yourself. Um, most cases rested on confession from the accused, and it actually was really crazy how many women just started telling elaborate tales of how they fell under the devil's possession. And, I mean, while yes, most of the time there was obviously, like, torture involved, but within Elizabethan era, there wasn't quite as much as that than James's time, but some of these women just straight out confessed. I guess they felt guilty for something they didn't actually do. I don't know, but it was insane how many people just came forth and started confessing. And it's like you knew, you knew the, the resolution was death. So it's like, it just, it was weird. It was weird. And some of these women, a lot of them underwent torture of some kind. And then, of course, a couple of them did just openly admit to it. So maybe they were doing some kind of fancy, fancy spells. I don't know. So later, finding the typical witch's mark um, became kind of a thing. And uh, as well as asking someone to recite a prayer, and if they had any kind of struggle doing it, then that was also means of evidence. Of course, marks could be anything as simple as a mole, a scar, an unusual birthmark. All of that counted and could easily condemn you. And unfortunately, women would be brutally stripped back then in desperation to find any kind of mark. And then oftentimes it would involve cutting their hair and just really kind of gruesome brutality. So all the women accused in the first two trials were of poverty level, which I said before, and relied heavily on like poor relief and support. So three years after the 1579 account, there was another more aggravated account. Um, and this case involved Ursley Kemp, and she was a poor woman who, like others, uh, always had a stare of suspicion following her around, and she gave miscellaneous services to her neighbors and oftentimes even acted as a midwife for a lot of them. She would also help nurse children and help others break bewitchment pretty much. So Grace Thoreau refused her the right to help nurse her child or the child that belonged to Mr. Darcy, which this is funny because Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy are two names that are in this case. So I really would be fascinated to know if um she Jane Austen like somehow read about the witch trials and like picked these names from that even though I know it had nothing to do with the witch trials but I just find it very odd that Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy are two of the names in this case and those are the two names in Pride and Prejudice so, anyway, Mr. Darcy's child then later fell ill, and, or no, didn't fall ill, fell out of its crib, and it actually broke its neck. And so, obviously, with that, its muscles became lame, and, um, Ursley was accused, even though Ursley actually came and, like, helped try to nurse his child back to health, and it did work. Like, the lameness started going away, but then she wanted to be paid for the help that she gave. The other 
lady said that she was too broke to be able to pay. And so then uh, Ursula got mad, supposedly cursed the child again, and the lameness came back. And so during this um, trial, Ursula's eight-year-old son actually was like pulled to the stand and confessed that she fed four imps, two that she used for laming and two that she used for killing. And after being told that mercy would be taken upon her if she confessed, she broke down, accusing other women of witchcraft as well, um, which one of the other accused was Elizabeth Bennett. And she also confessed crazy stories as well. Now, it was not common, usually, for children to be put on trial at all. In any other kind of case, that would not have been a thing that was done back then. But when it came to the witch trials, it was not uncommon to see children of their mothers and coming up and accusing their own families of witchcraft, which is crazy. Can you imagine having your child, like, accuse you of witchcraft and inevitably being the one that kind of sentenced you to death? Like... Crazy. Crazy. And kids are so young and naive, they don't know what they're talking about, you know? They don't know the severity of what they're saying. And I feel like a lot of the the jury and the people putting these witches on trial took full advantage of manipulating their own kids. So... Spirits showed up as all forms of animals, particularly in vivid color schemes, and the cat was definitely one of the most traditional ones used. Um, women were given free reign to pile up silly accusations against one another, and there was really no proof that was ever like needed. Uh, the trials of 1582 was when examination of the mark was made important. The judge would appoint the jury of the accused to make the examination. Two things appeared towards the end of Elizabeth's reign. So, one, the people in general were beginning to grow, like, even more against witchcraft. Like, there was really that resentment and hate towards it, and it was becoming more intense, which we see when James also takes the throne. However, the administration at London was becoming a little more lenient. They weren't, they weren't making as big of a deal about it. So the first half of her reign, few people got off, but during the second half, a lot more accused were able to be discharged. So those cases that did go against the accused were more smaller type towns. They were independent from the assize courts, so the municipal, like local authorities, they were the ones to blame for like the hanging of the witches. So there are about 50 executions that were between the time of 1563 and 1603. The records are pretty incomplete though, so there is no way to know the exact amount. Um, okay, then we move on to Reginald, Reginald Scott, and he was kind of influential in the fact that he um, kind of questioned more of the witchcraft accusations and kind of, he couldn't outright deny the existence of witches because that would have gone against, like, the government and the king and, like, the church, so that was kind of a no-go, but he definitely questioned things. Um, he based his discoveries on actual evidence, although he never outright said he didn't believe in witches, he definitely heavenly, heavily implied that. And he had a very healthy dose of skepticism. Um, he studied at Hart Hall in Oxford before coming back to his estate in Scott's Hall, where he kind of settled down and kind of went into his duties of being a husband, as well as running an estate. Uh, he also really enjoyed reading kind of obscure authors that a lot of people might have kind of bypassed. He was kind of into that. After hearing a few false accusations, he went on a mission to almost kind of defend some of these these people and the misfortunate things that happened to them. Um, he was kind of a modern day investigator, really. And he really did push 
having some kind of credible evidence. So to him, based on the New Testament of the Bible, possession was simply a disease. So it wasn't actually a true possession in the way that we think of possession. It was more from just a disease. To him, witches were either one of two things. Uh, they were either concerners, people that used trickery and fraud, or poor doting women. And he, uh, he also wrote the discovery of witches that exerted influence on the community and most likely inspired other authors, such as George Gifford, to speak out about the unfair accused. And although Guilford wasn't as influential as Scott, he still did, you know, make a difference. So the next section was on the exorcists. So this is more pertaining to one particular man named John Darrell, who claimed to be an exorcist, and he would go around and he'd have people acting with him, and pretty much fake acting like he was doing an exorcism and um, of course eventually he got found out so his scheme definitely made not only himself and the people that were working with him look bad but it also really made the Catholic Church look bad as well. Um, then you had Samuel Harsnett and he was another man who really questioned the realness of witchcraft. In fact, he took a very aggressive and almost sarcastic approach to it. And it was said that he pretty much said everything with a sneer on his face. And if his writing had been a little less hateful and a bit more lighthearted, he might actually have succeeded in laughing out superstition in England. Then the next section is all about James I and witchcraft. So James grew up in Scotland, so the whole concept of witchcraft was not like a new thing to him. Uh, he did believe in witchcraft, uh, but towards the end of his reign, there was a bit more question about it to him. Uh, especially, I think, when he kind of looked at all the deaths that were caused. I don't know if he necessarily had remorse for it, but he maybe realized that it wasn't quite as serious as he thought it was originally. Um, he, he definitely wanted to accuse the guilty, but he also put an emphasis on not convicting the innocent either. And so he really didn't like false accusations. And later when he found out how many false accusations were coming about, it did kind of change his tune a little bit. So some references say that he did get involved with some of the trials and some of the examinations as well as potentially some of the torture that went on. Other references said that he stayed out of it and was kind of more involved from a distance. This book I've been reading said that he actually was involved with some of the cases. Um, he published his demonology book in 1597, and this book was kind of influential in regards to the fact that the king wrote it, and it pretty much talked about all these witches and demons, and pretty much allowed for the people to continue on this reign of terror, so to speak. So James used three different methods to convict his witches. And the three methods were, one, um, a testimony from someone else could be enough to send you to an early grave, a witch's mark, and then the water theory of tying somebody up and pretty much tossing them into a lake. And if they floated, they were a witch because the waters of baptism were not embracing them, or if they sunk, uh, that meant that they were forgiven and were not guilty of witchcraft. But um, in case maybe you didn't pick up on it, both of those ended in death. So 
not really a great method for the person being accused. Um, it was also noted, there's another article I was reading um, about it, and it was talking about the difference between women and men and how men tend to have more muscle mass, and women tend to have a little bit more, and this is nothing against men or women, but a little bit more, like, fat to them. And so a woman would naturally float more because fat is less, like, dense, so, like, you float. And the men had more muscle, which is heavier, so they would sink. Um, so, yeah. Super, super effective way to figure out if somebody was, you know, a witch. Under Elizabeth, like I said before, you had to prove, kind of, actually that someone murdered somebody. Or that they legitimately harmed someone. Or they had to openly confess to it. Under James, it was a lot more lax. Like, it took hardly anything to get anyone accused. As I mentioned before, use the usage of a familiar was super popular to gain evidence. Um, they, they were considered imps of the devil. So within James's reign, he doubled the amount of executions compared to Elizabeth. So 40 to 50 were accused of the crime, and all but one happened within the first 15 years. Um, of 37 cases in his reign where the capital sentence was given, 17 were, undi were on indictments for witchcraft that had not caused death, while the other 20 cases the accused were actually charged with murder. So that meant that two-fifths of those that were convicted under James would have actually been pardoned under Elizabeth. Like I mentioned, most of the women were of poor status. However, that was not always the case. And this was um, especially the case for the Lancashire trials of 1612. Alice Nutter was actually came from a very well-known, like wealthy, rich country family. And uh, she was with good standing within society. Her children were, you know, well behaved and of good standing. She wasn't known to be like envious or have malice or hate towards anybody, but she was accused of desperate crimes, whatever that entails, and she was sent to the gallows. And for whatever reason, not really known to history why her high family name and connections couldn't save her, but it couldn't. Next, I want to talk about the Pendle Trials, because those are very well-known trials within the whole witch scene. Um, it first kind of revolved around three families, two of which were known to kind of have supernatural abilities. They were at odds with each other, and um, it was the Southerners and the Chetoxes, and then the last was also the Nutter family was involved too. And this trial primarily took place at Lancaster Castle, and this was the place where the most people were hung out of anywhere else. And it actually got the name of the Hanging Town, because nine witches were hung with supposed proof of meeting at, a Mal at Malking Tower, where the rest of the Pendle forced witches came together to conspire, to free the other witches that were captured, and then they all went out and about in their dress and riding horses, and supposedly witnesses said they literally just vanished, like disappeared. And so by the end, there was 16 women and four men that were tried like at the assizes. So Towards the end, like I said, James got kind of tired of all the falsely accused witches, and he almost straight up kind of denied their existence at that point. The only reason he didn't completely come out and say that was due to the church and the state. Even Shakespeare took inspiration from James's um, book because he based 
Macbeth on some of those uh, stories and rituals that he made the, the weird sisters from. And then lastly, Celtic paganism was kind of a big thing when James first took over. Uh, and I'm pretty sure he was in charge of like Ireland, Scotland, and England. And so to kind of gain control and to avoid getting sacrificed, so to speak, for, you know, messing up or doing something wrong, he kind of took religion, as a lot of the times we see, and used it to create fear, to create resentment and hate towards the Celtic paganism, pagans, um, and pretty much saying they were evil. So, didn't exactly help that situation out much. Um, but that is all I've got for section one. So if you like this video, please give it a like, subscribe, ring notification bells. Uh, I try to get videos out most weeks, but sometimes I just don't have anything to talk about and I'm not going to just randomly make a video that nobody's going to care about. So yeah, but other than that, uh, be kind, stay curious, always speak your truth, and I will see you next time for another video. Bye!